just appreciate Sharon for leading our administration and uh, helping us out. Thank you, thank you. Thank you for those people who have stepped up already and are volunteering. I'm excited. Well, happy, uh, beautiful Sunday. Spring is in the air. And uh, I have uh, two things I want to share. One is uh, good news. Next week, mass off officially, but spring forward. Bad news. <laughs> you have to wake up early, amen. Well, I'm so excited today because we are in the book of Revelation. How many of you are learning something from the, from the teaching, from the scripture? Amen, somebody. I just want to ask for your input. There's no greater time for us to study the end of the world because we are living at the, time, at the end, at the finish line. It's almost, we are seeing the wars and rumors of war happening in Russia and Ukraine. The Bible says, don't be surprised about that. That's toward the beginning of birth pangs or the beginning of troubles that we're going to see as we approach the ending. As we all know, this world has come, will come to an end one day. And God told us already in the book of Revelation, I don't know about you, when you know how it will end, it gives you hope. Right? When you watch a movie, even though it's a tor hair, uh, t terror or horror, but if you watch the movie already, ah, the, the actor will not die. You know, you could watch it with kind of peace and confidence. And let me tell you how the, the book will end or how this world will end. At the count of three, I just wanted to shout it out. You know, the, the morning service are really on fire. For, on fire. I hope the 1130 are on fire too. Come on, somebody. Yeah. At the count of three, I want you to shout, Jesus wins. One, two, three. Jesus wins. For the last time. Jesus wins. If you're watching online, would you type it in? Jesus wins. Amen. Amen. W look at the next slide as we study this, as we are preparing this, as we are praying for Ukraine. As we all know, uh, we will ask you for a special offering toward the end. Uh, we'll go to Conway of Hope, Ukraine. They're already there. I'll explain to you later on, aside from our regular tithes and offering. Uh, what can we do for Ukraine? Look at that, those people. Did you know we have 2,000 Assembly of God churches in Ukraine? That's our brothers and sisters. And more than thousands of pastors and missionaries, they're still there. They moved to the refugee center, but they're doing the work. They're mission serving the orphans. The best thing we could do is to pray. In Revelation chapter 5, I want to convince you that prayer is powerful. How many of you believe that prayer is powerful? Yes. Sometimes we take prayer lightly. Oh, I've I tried everything I could do. Maybe I could just pray. It's like the last thing. No, for prayer is the best thing for you to do. Amen? Amen. And did you know your prayers will, will not expire? It will outlive you. Look at Revelation 5. This is heaven. John saw a vision. said when he had taken the scroll... The four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb, this Jesus, and it's holding a harp and golden bowls of incense, which are the what? Prayers. Do you know whenever you pray, it's like an incense going up to heaven. And God has a big golden bowl. He treasured your prayer. I don't know about you, when before when we don't have Facebook, we don't have, a, uh, we don't have a texting, when my wife and I, we were separated, uh, we're, we're not married yet, and every time she sends a letter to me, a love letter, I put it something under my pillow, I stack it up, and every now and then when I miss her, I will read it. Imagine whenever you pray, God is putting it in a golden bowl like an incense of prayer of the saints. Amen. So what I'm challenging you, don't stop praying. Amen. As we are devastated, February 24, Russia attacked Ukraine. We're now going on the second week. And God already told us there's a script. Matthew 24, would you please read this with me? Nation will go to war against nation. Kingdom against kingdom. You know, whenever there's a war, there'll be food insecurity. When it's right? There'll, there'll be famine. And worse, there will be earthquake in many parts of the world. 
But God said this only the first of birth pains. You know, when a woman is about to give birth, the labor pains, it gets stronger and stronger with more to come. What we're seeing that's happening in Ukraine is just a tip of the iceberg of what will happen during the Great Tribulation. And we know what happened after that. Look at the gas prices nowadays. It's $6 something. And get ready, church. They are saying it will be probably like $10 before summer. It's going to be tough. It's going to be hard. This is the life that we're living in right now. So all of people right with this, maybe they're asking, the end is near. They're saying the end is near. So it, sometimes it's hard for us to be positive when you will see humanism, you will see legalism, there's fundamentalism, there's hedonism, there's consumerism, there's globalism, there's atheism, the agnosticism, there's modernism, there's postmodern, neo postmodernism, and the result is we become fatalism. What do we need? We need some optimism. Everybody say we need to be positive. Amen, somebody. Where do we get that positive, uh, not just hype? The promise of God. Read this with me, Charisma. When these things begin to take place, everybody say, stand up, look up, lift up your head because your what? Your redemption is drawing. Everybody tell the person next to you, Jesus is coming soon. Why do we need to look up? Because Jesus will come down from heaven. So today... I want to ask you to travel with me to heaven from the scripture. God gave us description. I don't know about you when you were trying to buy a house, you go to see the model house. And then the realtor will tour you to the, with a private tour. This is the room. This is the, this is the garage. This is the kitchen. So God gave, us, God gave John a private tour of what heaven looked like. And John wrote it in the book of Revelation. As if Jesus is giving John a private tour of heaven. And then he wrote a letter. That's why I entitled this message, Hello from the Other Side, a sneak preview of heaven. So when we get to heaven, we will not be stranger. Oh, I, we know what to do. Oh, yeah, this is a Jesus. Oh, yeah, this is a prophet. Oh, this is a, uh, the promise of Jesus. Look at chapter 4, verse 1. Please read this together. After this, I look... And there before me was, everybody say, a door standing open in heaven. So after this, after the rapture, why is the door of heaven open? Because the Christians going up. And the voice I had first heard speaking in the, like a trumpet. Come up here. Jesus invited, come up here. And I will show you what must take place after this. So it's very clear. So what is heaven? Can I ask you, what heaven looked like? You know, one thing that we could learn about kids, their imagination is really amazing, right? One time a kid was asked, what is heaven? The teacher asked, what is heaven? And this kid said, oh, heaven is it's a beautiful place. There will be no assignment. There will be no work. And there will be no principal unless the teacher is there too. <laughs> and then the mom was explaining to her daughter what is heaven. And happened that she's giving her a bath. Said, you know what heaven looks like, dear? Heaven is like Johnson's baby shampoo. No more tears. Amen, somebody. Amen. How many of you know in heaven there's no more tears? Amen. Amen. Listen to what the promise of God says. And God shall wipe away tears from their eyes. Let's read this charisma. There shall be no more death, neither sorrow, nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. Everybody say, no more death, no more dictator, no more war, no more COVID, no more crying, no more, no more pain. Now, did you know in heaven there will be three surprises? When we get to heaven, you will be surprised who's not there. Oh my gosh, where's Pastor James? He didn't make it. <laughs> He's my leader. And you will be surprised 
for the people who's there. How many of you say, I didn't expect you to be here. You're the last person I thought you're going to make it to heaven. And then, you know, the next surprise, tell the person next to you, you're there. You're there. Tell the person next to you, you're there. you're there. So who's not there? Who's there? And you're there. So now, let me take you to heaven from the scripture. But let me take you the timeline first. This is how will it will end. So please, capture this. First coming of Christ is we know Christmas. Then he died on the cross, rose again. Went up, sent the Holy Spirit. That's the birth of the church. We are now in the church age. Today, I'm speaking, we're still in the church age. When the rapture happened, the church will be rapture. The rapture will go up to heaven. Imagine this. While we're having a seven-year honeymoon in heaven, there will be seven great years of hardship and tribulation on earth. Then Jesus will come again and touch down in Jerusalem, will set his kingdom on earth. That is called the millennial reign. That is 1,000 years. And we'll get to reign with Jesus. Could you please tell the person here, if you get to reign with Jesus, we'll come back from heaven to set his kingdom here on earth. And then and only will the prayer will be fulfilled. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. War is not God's will. It's not the plan of God. But this earth is not under God right now. Later on, in 1,000 years, God will set up his government here. And Isaiah 9, 6 says, and the government will be upon his shoulder. That's why there's no perfect government because there's no perfect leader. But when Jesus took on the throne, he sets his kingdom here on earth. That will be 1,000 years of peace on earth. Then Satan will be judged forever, be, end up in bottomless pit. And God will create the new heavens and the new earth. And that is like saying, finally, we will live happily ever after. You know why heaven is very important? It was mentioned in the Bible 532 times. If God mentioned it 532 times, it's very important. If you want to learn more about heaven, I recommend invest on it. Buy a book called Heaven by Randy Alcorn. Randy Alcorn said, and I quote, Satan labors to give people an inaccurate view of heaven. Our enemy slanders three things. The enemy hated God's person, God, Satan against Jesus. The enemy hates God's people. Come on, somebody. You have an enemy, whether you like it, Satan is against us, amen? And the enemy is against God's place, heaven. Can I ask you a question? Why is the devil slandering heaven? You know why? He was evicted from heaven. Amen, somebody? He used to be living there, and then he was kicked out from heaven and ended up on earth and will end up in hell. That's why he wants us to have a wrong view of what heaven looks like. First, I want you to know, when you say heaven, it's not just like a, a cliche, oh, for heaven's sake. It's not a figment of your imagination. It's a real place. Everybody say this to me, heaven is a real place. Listen to what Jesus said. Would you please read this with me, Charisma? Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me, Jesus said. In my Father's house, many mansions. If, if it were not so, I have told you. Everybody read this with me. I go to prepare what? A place for you. And if I go and prepare again a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. That where I am... There you may be also. Everybody say, that's heaven. You know where heaven is? Where Jesus is. The streets of gold and the, and, the, and the beautiful place is just a bonus. What makes heaven heaven is Jesus is there. Hallelujah. Could somebody say amen to that? Amen. And God is saying, I go to prepare a place. It's a real place. John went up there and saw it. And in fact, the reason why it's a real place, Paul says this, our citizenship is in, how many of you are proud to be an American? Come on, somebody. 
Me, I'm proud to be an Asian American. I was not born here. I immigrated here to my wife. I'm proud to be an American citizen. But you know what I'm more proud of? I'm proud to be the citizen, member of the citizen of the kingdom of God. Come on, somebody. That is the best citizenship. This world is not our home. We are heavenly citizens living temporary here on earth. Amen. That's why Paul says, the worries, the pain, the tribulation, the troubles we're going through, it's nothing compared to what we will achieve in heaven. Hang in there. Our citizenship is in heaven. Our eagerly await our Savior, Jesus, from heaven, from there. Picture this, that heaven is a home, sweet home. Do you feel like homesick? Sick and tired of what you're seeing around this world? That's just a way of whetting our appetite. One day, my home will be in heaven. So that's why I, ch I encourage you, church, don't get too immersed in this world. This is just a tent. We will not live here permanently. When the sound of the last trumpet sound, boom, come up here. I'm, I'm out of here. That's why home, sweet home. Then heaven is a redemptive place. Everybody say redemptive. That's a big word. Everybody say buyback. That's redemption, buy back. Uh, I'll give you an example is this. There's this one dad who's a handyman, made a boat. And so gave it to his son. And one day the son is playing by the river. And then the strong current took the boat and then basically it's gone. So the boy was crying home. He said, Dad, I'm sorry. I lost the boat that you made. He said, it's okay. I can make you another one. Then one day they were walking on the street in the marketplace they saw the boat for sale in the marketplace. And so the boy said, that's my boat. No, it's not yours. The owner said, no, I bought it. That's not. No, my dad made No, no, it's not yours. So this boy went back home. He said, dad, I saw the boat. It's for sale in the marketplace. And now it's for sale. And they said, how much? And said, okay, no problem. Then the dad went to the market and paid for the boat. And now the boy said, now this boat is twice mine. God the, 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 the dad made it for him, and then the dad bought it for him. That's what you call buyback. I'll explain it to you because this is very important. Let's all read this together, Charisma. Then I saw the right hand of him who sat on the throne, a scroll with writing on both sides and sealed with seven seals. Everybody say a scroll. That's very important. Everybody say a scroll. I saw a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice. Let's read this together. Who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll? Everybody say, no one in heaven, on earth, under earth could open the scroll or even look inside. Everybody say, I wept much because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll. The key word here is the scroll. So John saw Jesus sitting on the throne. And now in chapter 5, he saw Jesus sitting on the throne with his right hand holding a scroll. The right hand in the Bible speaks of the power and authority, the right hand of God. What is that scroll? That's an ancient document. I'll explain it to you later on. It's a title deed. It's a real estate paper. It's a title deed. You know, in real estate, right, the one who has the title deed is the owner. You know, it's only America that we buy a house here. And then they call us homeowner. But in reality, the bank owns it, right? <laughs> we don't have the title deed yet. How do you know we don't own it? Stop paying for your mortgage. And then you will know who's the real owner. The one who has the title deed, right? I remember the story from Kuya Homer. They were telling us a story that Tita Lulu, they have properties in the Philippines. And then the parent passed away. And Tita Lulu was the eldest and they're young. They didn't know that the business partner of, of Tita Lulu's parent took the title deed of their property and they lost it all because somebody took the title deed, stole it. Now, this scroll is a title deed of the price of the whole earth. Follow me on this, okay? So that you would understand this, you need to learn the background of ownership of land in the Old Testament. Did you know in the Old Testament, Land, 
Let me just show first some great real estate and they'll show the, the, what I'm alluding to. Do you know the Alaska Purchase? You know how much our U.S. government pay for Alaska? Seven million dollars. They say that's a good deal. Alaska. What about the state of Louisiana? Our president during the 1800 paid 15 million dollars. But you know what they said? The best real estate transaction, those of your mortgage people, you know what's the best real estate transaction? This piece of property. That's Manhattan Island. The most expensive city to live is Manhattan, New York. The average price, a single home, is like 1.8 million. The rental average is 3,500. Renting is more expensive. That is a, like, wow. Do you know how much Peter Minuit, I want to show first, Peter Minuit bought it in 1626, Manhattan Island. Can I have a guess? Come on, somebody. How much did he pay for the Manhattan Island? Google this. $24. That is before Donald Trump. That out-trumps Donald Trump. Imagine paying $24 for the entire city of Manhattan in New York. Now, picture that in your mind. The title did, the scroll. Now the earth. Who owns this earth? Who has the rightful ownership of this earth? And, the, and Jesus was holding on to the scroll. Here's the background. Land in Israel could never be permanently lost. What's the meaning of that, Pastor? Here, if you don't pay your mortgage, you could lo lose it, right? For closure. If you cannot pay your mortgage, if a person was forced to forfeit a piece of land, eventually, a relative could buy it back. Everybody say redemption. There's a lot of chairs broke. If you could sit down so I could concentrate. I'm a traveling pastor, but I don't want to preach to a traveling congregation. So everybody say, relative could buy it back. So this person had to be what? Everybody say, rel relative. relative. Everybody say, kinsman redeemer. Kinsman. Everybody, kinsman, re everybody, kinsman redeemer. Kinsman. And that relative must be willing, not forced. And that relative must be what? Able to pay the price. Example. Remember the story of Ruth. Ruth is a beautiful love story of redemption. So Ruth, uh, a Moabite, her mother-in-law, Naomi, left Bethlehem. If you could put it on the screen, that would be awesome. Ruth, the, the redemptive story. So while they moved to Moab, both of the sons of Naomi passed away. But they married Moabite women. So now... Naomi said, I have no future here anymore. If you look at the next slide, you will see Ruth. And so Ruth told her mother-in-law, how would you like to have a daughter-in-law like that? The husband died, and the daughter said, where you go, I will go. Your God will be my God. So Naomi said, I cannot promise you any inheritance anymore. I have no more children, but I want to go with you. So they traveled to Bethlehem. When they arrived at Bethlehem, Naomi was penniless, pauper, like a pop, she really down to zero. And so Ruth has to work. She's working as picking up the leftovers of the harvest. One day, there's this one dude, his name is Boaz. So, so Ruth, and fell in love with Ruth, and then told Naomi, and Naomi said, oh my gosh, Boaz? She said, that's my relative, and he likes you. Please, please get married to him, and then let him buy back our property that we have lost. That's a kinsman redeemer. Land in Israel, a property could never be permanently lost. Another example. Why? Because God made the law. Let's look, let's look at the law. According to Leviticus, can we show it on the screen? Before this, uh, can we show it? Everybody read this together. They retain the right of buyback after they have sold it. One of their relatives may? That's, that's awesome, right? 
Like now, you have lost my house of foreclosure. No, but, oh yeah, yeah, but I have a relative who wants to pay it, buy it back for you. Okay, praise the Lord for that. That's in the Old Testament. That's a law. Another example. Please track with me. This is very important. Jeremiah 32. Jeremiah is locked up in jail for preaching the gospel. He's a prophet. Because his prophecy is this. Judgment is coming to Israel because we are not obeying God. God will judge us and allow the Babylons, Babylons to capture our nation and take our kids to captivity in Babylon. That's Jeremiah's prophecy and the people, oh, I don't want to hear that prophecy. I don't want that doom and gloom scenario. They lock him up. While he was in jail, a relative visited him. Let's all read this together. And Jeremiah said, the word of the Lord came to me. That's the name of the relative. Hanamel, son of Shalom, your uncle is going to come to you and say, buy my field in Anathoth, that's outside Jerusalem, because the nearest relative, it is your right and duty to buy it. Let me give you a perspective. For example, this example, you have relatives in Ukraine. And your Ukrainian relatives are being bombed right now by Russia. said, hey, uncle, would you buy my house? Would you buy my property? That's a crazy idea. What would you buy a property that's being bombed? And later on will be wiped out, right? That's not wise investment. But Jeremiah, as a statement of faith, bought that property knowing the Babylonians will come and, 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 and make this place like valueless. But after 70 years, God made a promise. Your people will be back to Israel. And so that piece of property will be inherited by your relative. So it's a statement of faith that J Jeremiah bought that piece of property knowing the Babylonians will come because later on, 70 years after that, my relative will get the, the property for themselves. Jesus made that promise to Jeremiah. Everybody read this together. This is what the Lord All-Powerful, the God of Israel says, take both copies of the record of ownership, title deed, sealed copy, and the copy that was not sealed, and put them in a clay jar that will last a long time. Keep it safe. That's a title deed. And this is what the Lord All-Powerful, the God of Israel says. Everybody read this with me. In the future... My people will once again buy houses and fields for grain, vineyards. Now you understand, right? A land could never be permanently lost. So Jesus is holding the title deed of earth. Can I ask you this question? Where are your thinking cap? Why would Jesus buy the earth if he already is the owner? He created the earth, right? In the beginnings. In the God created the heavens and the why would Jesus buy it? Because there's a usurper who stole the title did. His name is Satan. God created a perfect world. And then he gave the title did to his beloved creation. His name is Adam. And God told Adam. This is paradise. It's yours. Subdue it. Multiply. Have dominion. You're the owner. I'm giving it to you. It's paradise. And then one day, Adam listened to his wife. That's why most of the problems that we have is when you listen to your wife. <laughs> no, just kidding. Just kidding. Listen to this wife. And the wife listened to the devil. And they ate the forbidden fruit. From then on, listen to me carefully, the title deed of the possession of the earth was taken by the devil. Listen to what the Bible says in Romans chapter 5. Just as through one man's sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men, because all sin. One sin of Adam we were all infected with a virus <laughs> called sin. And because of that, death spread to all. Jesus did not create death. So now the devil is ruling this world. 
we know what's also affected, not just humanity. The earth was cursed. That's why there's typhoons. That's why there's earthquake. That's why there were tsunamis. Those are not acts of God. And the animal kingdom become wild. You know, in the millennium, we will be hanging around with lions. We will not be afraid of them. They will be not aggressor or predator. And look at what happened to the world we're living in right now. Let's read this charisma. For we know that even the things of nature, nature, like animals and plants, suffer in sickness and death as they await this great event. That's why God created a perfect world as we could look at the screen. And then sin came into this world. And now we live in a broken world. We live in a broken world. Satan is the ruler of this world. Do you know? Paul says, the God of this world. Look at this. 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. Small G or a cup of big letter G. Small. That's the devil. Who's the God of this world right now? Who's blinded the minds of the unbelievers? Who blinded the minds of Putin? Who blinded the minds of those evil people? The God of this world, the devil. And even John says this. Everybody reads together. We know that we are children of God and that the whole world is under the control of who? The evil one. Remember when Jesus was tempted by the devil? Jesus was taken to the top of the mountain and the devil showed him the kingdoms of this world. Listen to what the devil says. The devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. At this I will give you. So I was like, at this I will give you if you will bow down and worship me. Just an illustration. Any coincidence is just uh, for illustration's sake. Did Jesus rebuke the devil? Did Jesus say, hey, 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 stop. The world is not yours. Jesus did not say a thing. But he did not. Because he knew Jesus, the title deed was taken by the devil from Adam. That's why it has to be buyback. But the problem is, look at this. No one in heaven, on earth, and under the earth could open the scroll, even look inside. That's why John said, I wept much because no one was found worthy to open the scroll. Or look, then one of the elders said, let's read this. This is now positive. One, two, three. Do not weep. See the lion of the tribe of Judah. The root of David has triumphed. And he is able to open the scroll of the seven. Can we say a big shout out to Jesus Christ? Come on, somebody. Amen. Say, John, do not weep. No one. Abraham could not open it. Muhammad cannot open it. Buddha cannot open it. David cannot open it. But Jesus is the only one who could open the scroll. The lion of the tribe of Judah in the words of Aslan. In the words of Shakespeare, oh, uh, see, Lewis said, Aslan is on the move. That's why we just sang a, sang a song today, the lion of the tribe of Judah. Jesus said this. Let's read this together. Do not weep. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has what? Triumph. Then David looked. Oh, no, I'm sorry. John looked and look at the next slide. Then I saw a lamb. There's no lion. I'm not lying. <laughs> There's no lion. I'm not lying. He saw a lamb. Don't be confused. The lion and the lamb is the same. I'll explain it to you later on. Let's read this together. Looking as if he had been slain, standing at the center of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and the elders, the lamb has seven horns. Please don't take that literal. It's symbol. Seven eyes. There's no lamb with seven eyes, right? Seven spirits. What's the meaning of that? This tells us his authority. What's the meaning of seven horns? In the animal kingdom, the horn is a symbol of power and authority. That's your weapon. Seven means complete power. So Jesus has the seven horns, which simplifies omnipotent. Everybody say omnipotent. 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 It's a horn. It's a symbol of strength and authority. What about the seven eyes? Complete vision, complete seven. 
He could see anything. He could see everything. That's why you call it omniscient, right? God is omniscient. He's all-knowing. And then what about seven spirits? It means the Holy Spirit is everywhere. It means omnipresent. So that's why Jesus has the right to open the scroll. He's all-powerful. He's all-knowing. And he's all-seeing. Let's continue studying this. Let's look at the picture of Jesus here. It said, Jesus is the only one who could open the scroll to be, everybody said, kinsman redeemer. Okay, check. I want to check you if you're listening. What's the requirement to buy it back, a piece of property? Everybody say related, related. Willing, willing, and able. able. Can I ask you today, is Jesus related to you? Amen. How? The Word became flesh and dwelt. God became human, right? So He's related to us, amen? He understands our feeling because He became human. Now, is Jesus willing to pay the price? Or was He was just crucified at the cross and murdered by the Romans? Was He willing to die? Let's read this together, Charisma. Here's what the promise of Jesus said. John said, I am the good shepherd. What? The good shepherd gives his life. It was, do you know, no one can take away the life of Jesus. It's only him who could take his life. That's why when he was crucified, listen to what Jesus said this when, in, in John chapter, the next verse. No one can take my life from me. I sacrifice it voluntarily. Wow. For I have the authority to lay it down. And when I want to, also to take it up again. For this is what my father has come. That's why you know what, church? When Jesus died, it's not the nails. It's not the crucifixion. He gave his life. Remember the last words of Jesus at the cross? Father, into your hands I give my spirit. And then he breathed his last. He was not murdered. He, 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 he was not forced. He willingly carried the cross. He willingly. Is he able? Can Jesus pay for the title, the, the whole earth? Is he able? Does he have the bank, the financing? Yeah. Is Jesus able? You might, listen to what the Bible says here. How did Jesus pay for this? Everybody is together. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seal because you were slain. And with your? Yeah. You purchased for God's person from everyone. Yeah. Tribe. Language and everybody say, thank you, Lord. How much with his blood? How much is the blood of Jesus? It's priceless. He bled it out. It was not the nails that kept Jesus on the cross. It was his love for us. And then the Bible says, he purchased God's person. Everybody say, every tribe. Language, people, and? So hear me out, Charisma. Don't believe some people say when you get to heaven, you'll become like angels. You'll be sitting on the cloud or playing harms. Oh, that's so boring. You will not become angel. Tell the person next to you, you'll be you. Come on, somebody. And don't you believe that they'll say, we come all become look, looking like Jewish. No. How many of you, God loves you just the way you are? Everybody say, God loves us. Amen. Amen. Tribe. Tongue, nation, it's not assimilation. If God wants me to be white, God made me white. If God wants me to be black, God will created me as black. But God wanted me to be short, cute Filipino. So God may be a short Filipino. Come on, somebody. And when I get to heaven, I'll still be Filipino. My apps and my peace will still be mixed up. <laughs> Tell the person, God loves you just the way you are. So there's this old, old lady, she passed away. Went to heaven. And so, St. Peter, just a story. And Peter said, oh, your name is not in the book of life. Meaning your death should not be today. Oh, wow. I'm sending you back to earth. And you have seven more years to live. Do whatever you want. Go back to earth. And so this old lady was so happy. Oh, my gosh. I died and I came back to life. And she's old. And so seven years to so the person she did went to her doctor 
and had the cosmetic surgery, had her nose, uh, I got a uh, pointed nose, changed her hair to blonde, and everything that needs to be lip up, they had it lifted up, and then, so she's excited, she came out of the doctor's office, she's walking like a new person, and then uh, a car came, and he was, she ran over by the car, and she died. And then she went back to heaven, so St. Peter, you're a liar. You said, I have seven years, but I died. And so I'm I, I, beyond my pay grade. I have to talk to my boss. And then Peter called Jesus. Jesus, there's this lady who died. Though. And then he said, it should be seven years, but she's there. And Jesus looked at this lady. I'm sorry. I did not recognize you. <laughs> <laughs> Tell the person, God loves you just the way you are. Come on, somebody. <laughs> Don't mess up with what God has given you. Come on, somebody. Amen. <laughs> Every tribe. Every language, imagine that. Every tongue, every nation will be represented there. Now, this will humble you. I hope it humbled you. You know the most favorite title of Jesus in the book of Revelation? is not the Lion of the tribe of Judah. You know the most favorite title of Jesus in the book of Revelation? The Lamb. Jesus referred to himself as a Lamb. 29 times because that is his purchase for the title deed of this earth and our salvation that is his badge of honor church the only man-made thing you will see in heaven are the scars on jesus hands when he rose from the dead, he showed himself to Thomas and touched my side. Look at my wounds. Whenever Jesus looked at his hand, he sees you. This is what I paid for. I was slain. You know the word slain there in the original Greek? Slaughtered. Butchered. That's a cruel kind of death. Jesus was slaughtered was butchered at the cross. And his favorite title in the book of Revelation, call me as the Lamb. So he saw heaven. It's a real place. It's a redemptive place. There's a scroll. And Jesus is the one who oh, we can open it. He bought it back with his own blood. He's related to us. He's willing and he's able. Now what's the response in heaven? Heaven is a responsive place. So when he saw heaven, of course he saw the throne and Jesus was there. What's the response of the people? Oh, wow, awesome. Look at Jesus sitting on the throne. Can I take a selfie? Is that the response of the people in heaven? Church, listen to this charisma. Let's all read this together. And when he had taken it, the four living creatures and the 12 elders fell down before the Lamb. I don't know about you, church. When you see Jesus face to face, the proper response is worship. I want to speak to you, church. Don't look at worship as an opening act to the service. I came late to church because I, I miss the singing. I just want to admit the word of God. You're missing the point. When we're singing together, it's a picture of heaven. Come on, somebody. When we sing together before the sermon, it's a picture of heaven out of every tribe, tongue, and nation worshiping Jesus Christ. Amen. Worship is not an opening act. It's the most important thing. Amen. Yes, amen. Here I am to worship. Here I am to bow down. Here I am to say that you're my God. And the rightful response is worship. Church, the word worship, you know what's in the old English word? Worship. You only worship what is worthy. Is Jesus worthy? Yes. yes, he is. Look at this, church. We are worshipers. I like what Louis Giglio said. That is why we were created. That is what we do. It's not a matter of who, of you, if you worship or you do worship. The question is, who and what do you worship? We're all worshipers. Do you know that? Some people worship their body, their life. Some people, they worship science. 
Sometimes they worship themselves. We are all worshipers. The question is, who are you worshiping? You know, there's this, I'm not against sport, but let me tell you this. Do you know what is the number one idol in America? Super Bowl. This was before a Super Bowl in San Francisco. Listen to what the announcer said. Make no mistake, worship happens here. Listen to what they said. We were born to worship. That's why America invented the Super Bowl. Listen to what they said. We want the fellowship. The Super Bowl, the fellowship. we want the excitement. We want the mystery. Who's going to win? We want to see glory. Who's going to win this, the ring? And then our national religion is not Catholic or Protestant. It is sports. I'm not shooting down sports. I'm watching sports too. I watch Super Bowl. But it said, take away the place of God. It could be an idol. I want you to watch a short video clip. And please listen carefully to every word of this video clip. Everyone worships. Sure, not everyone wants to call it worship or even think about what they're doing. But everyone worships something. Everyone has some ultimate thing that they center their life around. Something or someone that they hope will give their life meaning or purpose. For some, it's religion. For others, it's money. For some, it's fun. For others, it's success or power. Or science or knowledge or beauty or popularity. For some, it's love or sex. For some, it's their family. But the Bible says, all things were made by Jesus and for Jesus. This means we were created to worship, but there is only one who is really worthy of our worship. That's why nothing else in this world satisfies. We keep on looking, we keep on striving, we keep on buying, but nothing delivers. Nothing brings us that deep satisfaction that we long for. But when you live your life with Jesus as the center, you're doing exactly what you're created to do. You're right in the place you're supposed to be. So the irony is that when we give our lives over to worship Jesus, that's when we actually find ourselves. Everyone worships, but we were made to worship just one. Amen. Everyone worship, but we were made to worship just one. And then he saw the Lamb. And he saw, said, I saw the lamb looking as if he had slain, standing, everybody say this important, center of the throne. Everybody say center of the throne. Center. You know, and we watch uh, medieval movies like the king is here, the queen is here, the dignitaries is horizontal. In heaven, it's not like that. There will be a center of the throne. To give you perspective, when we went to Hagia Sophia, this is called the center of the universe. All of the emperors and the kings back in the day, they were all enthroned and installed in that center. The one who sits or takes that place is the most powerful person on earth. It's called the center of the universe. In heaven, Jesus is sitting at the center of his throne. And we will be surrounding him. That's worship. You know what worship does? Worship centers. Who is in the center of your life right now? Money? Job? It's because your life revolves around that. 
put Jesus in the center. Everything revolves in Jesus. You know, one of my favorite pastors from New York, his name is Timothy Keller, a very smart guy, said this, worship is to fill your heart with the worthiness of God. God is worthy. That your response is this, your whole heart, you will reorient your life. Reorientation. Because you get so busy sometimes, you forget about God. Because you're dealing and willing here and moving here and get busy. Sometimes we get forget about God. When you worship, as you stop whatever you're doing and you revolve around the center of the universe, the center, the one who is full control, the one who's worthy to be praised, and you reorient your life with the one person, and that is Jesus Christ. It's putting Jesus at the center stage. And then I look and I heard the many voices of angels around the throne, living creatures and elders. And number of them was 10,000 times 10,000. Do the math. 10,000 times 10,000 is 100 million. And then 100 million times thousands of thousands. So there will be like billions of people in heaven surrounding the throne in worship to Jesus Christ. And we, they were saying with a loud voice, I would like to call Pastor Al to go to the, to the keyboard, said, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power, riches, wisdom, strength, and honor, and glory, and blessing. Would you stand up on your feet right now? Let's all read this together. Let's picture this. This is a throne room in heaven. And we are there with the angels, with Jesus, with the heavenly, with our heroes. And this is what we're going to say to Jesus. Let's all read this together. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is within them to Him who sits on the throne to the Lamb. Be blessing and honor and glory, power forever and ever. And four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worship. And verse 12 says, next slide please. Saying with a loud voice, let's shout it out. Is the Lamb who was slain to receive power, riches, wisdom and strength and honor and glory. Come on, Jesus deserves the best clap of praise in the house right now. Come on, let's give it. Let's wave our hand in honor of the one who is worthy to be praised. Let's have a practice right now, church. This is what we're going to do in heaven. When we see Jesus for the first time, we're going to fall down at our feet and worship Him and give Him all the glory. He deserves it. He is the center of the universe. Let's center our lives around Him. Let's reorient everything around Jesus. Jesus our Lord. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. With all creation I say praise to the King of Kings. You are my everything and I will
is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. With all creation rising, praise to the King of Kings. You are my everything. And As we are worshiping, call on our communion servers right now. together now. Holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. Come on. With all creation rising, praise to the King of Kings. You are my everything, and I will just the people that sing it out. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God. Oh, Jesus wants to hear that. 